So we did convergence of the Doob martingales, martingales associated with functions. And before we talk about more convergence or whatever, I'm going to detour a bit. I'm going to give another example of a martingale, which is another fundamental example, which is a bit more probabilistic. We take our probability space, we take our Barnack space. And what we'll do is we'll let GN be a sequence of integrable x valued random variables. I don't know why I'm suddenly emphasizing on the probabilistic language. They're in L1, right? That's what I mean. And these have to be mutually independent. Um, if you can't remember the definition of mutual independence, look in the appendix in the notes, it's in there. We don't need to dwell on it too much now, but we'll just, I'll move on very quickly from this. They have to be mutually independent and they need to all have mean zero. So the expectation of each of these variables is zero for all n greater than or equal to one. It doesn't have to hold for n equals zero in the way that we've indexed things. We let A be the filtration generated by G. So of course, G being a sequence of random variables is a stochastic process, but you don't really think of it as being a stochastic process in this example, but it, it is, right? Let's define the partial sum process, which probably has a nicer name than this. We'll call it Sigma bullet by sigma n is defined to be the sum from m from zero to n of gn. So we take these variables and we sum up the first n plus one of them. We sum them up up to index n. And this gives you a new random variable. It's a sum. If you do probability, you've seen all this before. If you don't, yeah. Now this partial sum process is a martingale. And the way that you see that is, well, I mean, you can look at this different sequence or you can look at it directly. We're gonna look at it directly here. Let's compute the, the AN conditional expectation of sigma N plus one. By linearity, we can just take out the first N terms or the terms up to N. And we have the other term, which is GN plus one. Now this sum here is AN measurable because AN is the filtration generated by G and G zero is A zero measurable, G one is A one measurable. All of these sigma algebras are contained in AN. So this sum is AN measurable. So the conditional expectation does nothing to it. And using an exercise in the notes, what is it? Exercise 3.8. And this is using here that GN plus one is independent of the sigma algebra AN. This is coming from the mutual independence of all of these random variables GN. So GN plus one is independent of G zero up to GN. In particular, the, it's independent of the sigma algebra generated by these functions. So the conditional expectation is just an expectation, it turns out. It just That's quickly, it um, yep. have we defined what independence means? Um, no, uh, it's, in the, it's in the appendix. Right. I have okay. to say, I'm not that 100% comfortable with the notation, with, the, with independence. I don't use it very much. I only use it in very naive situations like this one. I've written it explicitly in the notes. Don't ask me to recreate the definition on the spot or I will mess it up. <laughs> but it's in the oh. notes. And the only thing that we're using is that because GN plus one is independent of AN, the conditional expectation with respect to AN is just the expectation. Basically independence says that AN doesn't give you any relevant information about GN plus one. So the best estimate is just a constant given by its average. And by assumption, GN plus one has got mean zero, right? So this is nothing. <laughs> and you're left with 
the sum process up to index n. So this sum, this partial sum process is a martingale. So I guess in, in probability, there are the two most natural sources of martingales. One is martingales associated with functions and filtrations, the Duke martingale. The other is sums of independent mean zero random variables. That's also a natural source of martingales. Of course, there are more in a sense, but only in an abstract sort of sense. All right, that's an example. That's all I need to say about it. I'm going to come back to convergence later on, but before convergence, I just need to diverge a little bit into the topic of martingale transforms because they're important and they're important for some examples I want to look at. And just to foreshadow a bit, I was saying before about ha, um, what I was saying about ha, ha coefficients and ha expansions that you can define operators in terms of ha expansions. And of course, you can do an analogous thing with martingale expansions. You can take a martingale and look at its different sequence and define operators that act on the different sequences. And you get operators that are called martingale transforms. So it follows that there's going to be some subtle link between martingale transforms and operators defined with respect to higher expansions. Right? This is going to be important later on. But for now, I have to talk about martingale transforms so that we know what they are. These map martingales. into new martingales. They meant martingales, martingales. So in particular, they let you relate one martingale to another martingale. So if you know the properties of one and you know the properties of the correct martingale transforms, you can deduce properties of the other martingale, which can be quite useful because maybe you have a simple martingale that you understand it very well and you have the martingale you want to understand. If you can say, well, this one I want to understand is just this transform of the simple one. This is good for you, right? Oops. I'm trying hard to color code all of my text, but maybe it's not worth it. Let's define martingale transforms. We have our probability space. Given the probability space, given the Banach space, and given an X valued martingale. Uh, with respect to a filtration A board. And we're also given Y, which is another Banach space. So we're going to transform X valued martingales to Y valued martingales, just for the fun of it. We're given a sequence. I could have written this as T bullet a sequence of operators. And these are all assumed to be in L infinity on this probability space valued in the space of linear operators from X to Y. So not a sequence of operators, sorry. It's a sequence of operator valued functions. Or if you want to be really probabilistic, it's a sequence of operator valued random variables. So it's an operator valued stochastic process. Yeah, I'll write that. That's probably the natural way to think about it. Uh, and we make the assumption that the process T bullet is predictable. So remember that means that, well, adaptedness says that TN is AN measurable. Predictability says that TN is AN minus one measurable. So it's got more measurability. You can predict, well, you know the value of TN at time N minus one. These are our assumptions. The Martingale transform. of f by t. I don't think this is the standard wording, but I don't know what the standard wording is. Let's say the martingale transform of f by t. 
is the Y-bellied Martingale. Uh, we're going to call it T.F because I think that is somewhat standard. Anybody have issues with this notation? This is all good. Yeah. So it's a Martingale called T.F. And we're going to define it. Well, we could define it in terms of its different sequence. We're going to define it in two equivalent ways defined by on the one hand, we can specify the value of at time n, which looks a bit artificial the first time you see it. It's a sum of differences of the martingale or equivalently, a better way to look at it is explicitly in terms of its differences. So this definition is a much more natural one. Remember martingales can be defined in terms of their different sequences. You just sum them up and you get the values of the martingale. So we take the different sequence of the martingale we started with and we apply the operators to that different sequence one by one. And that's the definition. Of course, I didn't show that it was actually defining a martingale. I just claimed that it did. We should show that it does. So to show that this is a martingale, so it suffices to show, as I said earlier, each of these difference terms uh, is, I should say, strongly AN measurable. And here I do need to say strongly. And integrable, because that doesn't come for free. And we need to have the, the conditional expectation with respect to AN of the N plus one difference is zero for all n. These properties of the different sequence will are, are equivalent to the to this process being a martingale. So the strong a n measurability. Uh, how do we prove this? The different sequence of the original martingale is strongly measurable with respect to a n. And the operator valid function Tn is also strongly measurable. N minus one, but you don't need that here. It's An measurable, valid in Lxy. And here you can use Pettis basically, or you can use just approximation by simple functions. And you can go through those details yourself if you like. The funny thing is in this case, I think it's actually easier to go directly by the approximation by simple functions than to use Pettis because establishing the weak measurability of this composition is a little bit funny because if you want to think of functionals acting on LXY, it's a little bit hard to think of. You can do it, but it's a bit hard to think of. So just approximate this difference by simple functions, approximate TN by simple functions, and you have an approximation of the composition by simple functions. Fine. the integrability. You just need to check the L1 norm of this thing. And using Holder's inequality, point one, uh, not point one, Holder's inequality and the definition of the operator norm. This is bounded by the L infinity norm of Tn times the L1 norm of Dfn. And this is finite by assumption because we assumed all these operator valid functions were in L infinity. So that's your integrability. And as for this property of the conditional expectations, well, you write out the definition, get T n plus one, DF n plus one. And then you notice that this Tn plus one is An measurable. 
because we assume that T was predictable, not just adapted, but predictable. And a key property of conditional expectations that is in one of the exercises, which one is it? 3.7. If you take a product of an A measurable, an AN measurable function and another function, and you take the conditional expectation with respect to AN, you can take that function out of the conditional expectation for free. Oops, wrong color. Like that. Which is a very useful property of conditional expectations. It's used all the time when you're dealing with conditional expectations. It's called taking out what is known or something like that. Basically, the, yeah, the product with the function that you already know doesn't affect the approximation of this function you don't know. And because f is a martingale, this conditional expectation vanishes. Great. So this tells you that this martingale transform of f by t is actually a martingale. It would be a bit weird if it wasn't that. Has anybody got any questions about that definition? We're not going to use this so much now, but this is going to be important later on. I mean, when we start using this again more seriously, I'll revise the definition and make sure you remember what it is. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but this is sort of like the discrete time version of a stochastic integral. It's exactly that. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. This is a stochastic integral in a special case where your integrals are sum. <laughs> this also gives you some hints on how you would go about defining a stochastic integral if you don't know how to do that. In fact, it is how you define a stochastic integral. You're approximated by simple processes where the thing is discrete and then you use this definition and you normalize it properly. It's like a definition of the um, Riemann integral, essentially. Starting with these nice, well, it's not even that, it's something different. But anyway, I'm not that good at stochastic integrals. So. This is a discrete time stochastic integral. You can go home and tell your parents, look, I know how to do stochastic integrals now. And they'll be very happy. I like examples. Let's do another example. Uh, we're gonna go back to our gambling example, actually. Back to the gambling example. I don't know if anybody missed it. We had this game, I think it was in the last lecture where I'd flip a coin over and over again and you'd bet a vector. And then we would add that vector if you win and subtract the vector if you lose. And we're using it as just a, an example of all of these things. Let's go back to that. We had this process S that was the state of your wallet at each time. Your wallet, of course, takes values in X because you have an X valued wallet. And this S process is basically the outcome of the game from your perspective. It was defined so that the difference is pi n plus one times x n plus one, where pi n plus one is the outcome of the n plus one coin flip, which is either plus one or minus one. Plus one is heads, minus one is tails. And x n plus one is your bet at time n plus one. And remember x was predictable because you need to be able to place your bet before the corresponding coin flip, not after, right? Uh, okay, so where am I now? So let's just remind ourselves the process pi, the coin flip process, generates a filtration A bullet, which was the coordinate filtration. I should say we're working on the probability space plus minus one to the N. So sequences of pluses and minus ones with the natural probability measure, the product of the uniform probability on each of the factors. This filtration is generating, well, it's a coordinate filtration. So pi is basically taking the nth coordinate that's this plus minus one that's the nth coin flip right uh, the random variables pi n 
are mutually independent. By construction, the coordinates on a product probability space, so they have to be mutually independent. You can check the details they are. So their partial sum process, uh, sigma bullet, sigma n is the sum, of course, from m from 0 to n of pi m. The partial sum process is a Martin girl. It's scalar valued. It's real valued, in fact, but we can consider real or complex scalars. And it's you can think of it as complex valued, but its values are real, actually integers even. Right, OK. Now let's assume that the bets, these betting vectors xn, these are actually functions on the probability space. They're random variables. Let's assume our bets are integrable, which is a, a natural assumption in gambling, integrability of your bets. How could they not be? <laughs> assume the bets are integrable. And let's write to be really pedantic, let's write the Barnack space X as being identified with the linear operators from C to X. <laughs> this is a little bit wacky if you've never done this sort of thing before. A vector X corresponds to the linear map from C to X given by, well not C, I keep thinking complex scalars, it's mapping K to X, of course. Scalars could also be real. Lambda maps to the vector lambda x. You can canonically identify a Banach space with the linear operators from the scalar field to the Banach space. The reason I'm doing this is because I want to consider operator valued Martingale transforms here, right? So I want to use the betting vectors x as a sequence of operators that I can use as coefficients in a Martingale transform. So x needs to be a space of operators Luckily, X can always be identified as a space of operators from the scalars to itself. Great. Yeah, that's a bit confusing. So having done that, the Martin girl transform uh, X, the Martin girl transform of Sigma by X is defined. So Sigma is a scalar valued Martin girl. X is a sequence of vectors identified as operators. And X is operators from the scalars to X and Sigma is scalar valued. So we can, we can apply these operators to the Martin girl. It's defined and it's X valued. Now, what is this difference? What is the different sequence? of this Martingale transform. What is the Martingale transform? That's the question here. Let's identify what it is. It's Xn applied to D sigma n, where Xn is being considered as an operator. Let's write it like this. And D sigma n is pi n. And this is just a scalar. So the way that we're identifying vectors with operators here, this is pi n times Xn, where now Xn is being thought of as a vector. And this is the difference of the, the wallet process. Right. So what this tells us is that the wallet process is actually equal to the Martingale transform of sigma by x. And what this tells you is that the, the state of your wallet is a Martingale. And it's actually the transform of the, the sum of coin flips process, this simple scalar value process by the choice of betting vectors X. So in a sense, everything we need to know about this, this gambling, this game in Barnack spaces comes from just the coin flip game without vectors in a sense. Of course, the geometry of the Barnack space can still intervene somehow if you want to have a particular goal 
in this game or your bets are restricted to certain sets then the geometry might come in but purely as a stochastic process it's just a martingale transform of the simple coin flip process which is nice to know it's also a nice indirect way of proving that the state of the wallet is actually a martingale you can prove it more directly than that you don't need to know what's a martingale transform but i like to do it this way okay that's that example So let's go back to convergence. Of Martin girls. Again. We're not going to have much time to actually prove anything. We just have 15 minutes. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of what we'll show in the next lecture, just to, to foreshadow it a bit to get you thinking about it. Given a a function f in LP on a probability space where p is less than infinity and given the filtration and all that, I'm not going to write all of this. We know that this martingale, this dupe martingale coming from f converges to the conditional expectation of f with respect to the limiting sigma algebra. We know that in LP. Um, Christoph's question was about the converse. Like if you have a martingale, when is it coming from a function? When is it a dube martingale? We're going to ask a different question. What about pointwise convergence? It's a related question. What about pointwise convergence? There's one sort of trivial situation where we automatically have the pointwise convergence. So we have pointwise convergence on the dense subspace, which is the, the union of all of the AN measurable functions. We showed in this proof in the last hour that this subspace is actually dense in the A infinity measurable functions. And we also showed at some point in that proof that this sequence, this martingale is actually stationary on this dense subspace. So if F is in LP of AN for some N, then the conditional expectation with respect to AM is actually equal to F for all M greater than or equal to N. So in finitely many steps, you reach the limit, you reach F and pointwise convergence is guaranteed. There's no convergence issues. It's a stationary limit, right? So what you have in particular is that the limit as M goes to infinity of this conditional expectation is F pointwise. In a sense, it's everywhere, but let's say almost everywhere because all of these objects are only almost everywhere defined. And I'm just gonna note this is a stationary limit. So on this nice dense subspace of functions that are actually measurable with respect to one of the sigma algebras in the filtration, this pointwise convergence problem is trivial because the, the limits are all stationary. How can we bootstrap up that convergence from a dense subspace to the whole space? How can we show that every LP function, which is measurable with respect to the limiting sigma algebra, A infinity, actually has this convergence almost everywhere. Oh, I shouldn't write it there. Yeah, okay. How do we know this? If you've done some harmonic analysis, you've probably seen this sort of thing before. Things like Fourier series or whatever, or things like um, Lebesgue differentiation. I'll talk about these. This is all about what I think is called Barnack's principle. Christoph can correct me if I'm wrong. Is this Barnack's principle of convergence? Barnack's convergence principle? Yeah, why not? May as well attribute it to Barnack, it was good enough. This is Barnack's convergence principle stated sort of non-rigorously. To prove almost everywhere convergence of a sequence, well, 
yeah, of a sequence of operators Tn. By that, I mean to prove that Tn of f converges almost everywhere pointwise to f for all f in some function space, which I'll just call Z. This is LPX in our case. If you want to prove an almost everywhere convergence theorem for some sequence of operators, it suffices to prove the almost everywhere convergence for all F in a dense subspace of Z. And also to prove boundedness of an associated maximal operator. So we're going to need to define some sort of maximal operator for this situation and prove that it's bounded. And this is going to be the dupe maximal operator, if you know the dupe maximal operator. So some examples of this convergence principle that you'd already know. You have the Lebesgue differentiation theorem. Which says that you can write a function as the limit as r goes to zero, let's say fx. It's the limit over averages of balls of radius r of the function, let's say fz dz, almost everywhere. This classic result in measure theory. The way you prove this is you prove it on a dense subspace. You prove it on Schwartz functions, for example, where the limit's easy to show. And the associated maximal operator is the Hardy-Littlewood maximal operator. And this is MFX. It's the supremum of R greater than zero of this average. So the maximal theorem says that this maximal operator is bounded on, on LP for all P greater than one, and it has a weak L1 estimate. And that's enough to give you by the Barnard convergence principle, the Lebesgue differentiation theorem. Because you have the nice result in the dense subspace and you have the boundedness of the maximal operator that lets you take that to the whole space. Another example is pointwise convergence of Fourier series or Fourier integrals. which I think Christoph talked about in his harmonic analysis class. Did he talk about that? Yeah, he's not in good. So you know that F is, well, I'm not gonna write out the whole statement. You can write F as, a, as being almost everywhere equal to the limit of its Fourier series if F is in LP for P greater than one. And this is Carlson's theorem, or the Carlson-Hunt theorem. Carlson did it in L2, Hunt did it in LP. Feffman did it better. Uh, I guess Lacey and Teela did it even better still. <laughs> uh, and the maximal operator is the Carlson operator, which you can write in the case of integrals as a supremum over frequencies of a partial Fourier integral. Uh, what is it, two pi i e to x d eta, if I've done that correctly. So you have convergence of Fourier series on, for example, Schwartz functions, because they're nice. You prove the LP boundedness of the Carlson operator. The Barnard convergence principle lets you then deduce that you have almost everywhere convergence of Fourier series for general LP functions for P greater than one. And there's some weird endpoint results as well that I don't know. But we're going to do something simpler than Carlson's theorem, thankfully. We're going to do convergence of Martin girls. <laughs> That's the end of the example. The, the maximal operator we're going to use for martingales is the Dube maximal operator. Take your probability space, take your Barnack space X, blah, blah, blah. For an X valued stochastic process, uh, F bullet. 
we define the do maximal function. I know I'm saying maximal function instead of maximal operator. The maximal function is, is this function here, m of f bullet of omega. It's a function on omega on the probability space. It is the supremum over n of the stochastic process evaluated at omega of its norm. This is the dube maximal function of f. m itself is the dube maximal operator. I mean, people confuse the terms maximal operator and maximal function. I like to try to get it straight. There are functions, there are operators. The maximal function is not an operator. The maximal operator is an operator. Pedantry. Um, yeah. So this is the dube maximal function of a stochastic process, not necessarily a martingale, just of a sequence of random variables. Uh, note that this is actually non-negative. Of course, it's not negative. It's defined in terms of norms. It's not vector valued. It's actually non-negative real valued, even though the stochastic process is vector valued. It's not negative and it's defined via this stochastic process given by the pointwise norm, which is a scalar valued process. Okay, it's also a non-negative real valued process, but the non-negative reals are contained in the scalar field. So let's consider it as a scalar valued process. So the analysis of this maximal operator is essentially scalar valued which means we're not gonna see any fancy vector valued things happening when we look at this operator. And the only properties we're gonna really be able to deduce from the dude maximal operator or maximal functions are properties that, we're, that are gonna hold for every Banach space. You can't see the geometry of X through this operator. That doesn't mean it's not useful. Like there are a lot of useful results that hold for every Banach space, but this isn't gonna give us anything really subtle. And just a little side note, since we don't have really much time to go into much, I can make an interesting side note. There's no real canonical, okay, real doesn't mean real as in real value. There's no, <laughs> there's no canonical vector valued do maximal operator. Uh, there's a candidate, which is called the Rademacher maximal operator. which I might talk about later on in the course, I might not. But this operator is not very well understood. It's not really clear whether it's the right X valued analog of the dube maximal operator. So I won't go as far as saying this is the analog. But for, for specific Barnack spaces or specific classes of Barnack spaces, there are proper canonical true vector valued analogs of the dube maximal operator. For example, for non-commutative LP spaces, if you know what they are, there is a, a non-commutative LP valued dube maximal operator that is truly the right thing to do here. This is coming from a paper by Marius Junger in I think 2002. So this is very new stuff and uh, I'm in the process of trying to understand that already. So I can't teach it to you, but I just wanted to make the note here that the dube maximal operator is really a scalar object. And the question of what is the right vector valued object is still sort of open in full generality. So we're at the, we're already at the cusp of theory here. <laughs> like I can't give you canonical answers to that. I guess I only have 30 seconds left according to my clock and I don't want to go drastically over, but let me just quickly look at what's on my last page. Do I want to do that now? I guess I don't. So we'll end here. What's going to happen in the next lecture is we're going to talk about LP bounds for the dube maximal operator, which will let us use the Barnard convergence principle to get pointwise almost everywhere convergence of Martin Gels in LP. And also in L1, because we're going to get a weak L1 estimate is going to suffice for that. And yeah, I think that's all I want to say now. Are there any questions?
Well, I, I couldn't help looking up the martingale on the Google as well. The first, yeah. first thing I can report, it's a word in all three languages that I looked up, English, French, and German. It means the same horse trap. Horse uh, trap. <laughs> horse trap or strap. Harness, uh, yeah. <laughs> actually, it was you, the, the, the way you use it to make sure the horse can't lift its head too high up so that it puts a mm -hmm. maximum on the height of the horse's head. Okay. The purpose is that if you try to steer left, right, and if the horse lifts the head to way up, then it gets confused what means left and right. <laughs> so that's, okay. it's, it's sort of an auxiliary thing for beginners, actually, or, or maybe in special circumstances. And I suppose it relates. That's what I was thinking. I mean, when I see this strap, I think it, it seems I'm looking at force equilibrium when I see the half function. But that's also <laughs> that's apparently nonsense. I think it has more to do with uh, this betting strategy is yep. sort of a maximum, right? You're giving yeah. yourself. So you say you want to earn uh, one dollar, say, okay, and so the first time you bet, you just put the maximum one dollar. If you win, you're done, and if you lose, you realize now you have to win two dollars to reach the maximum, right? So next mm -hmm. time around, you bet two. So each time you're betting right there to the maximum that you were planning to go to at the beginning. So maybe that's, I'm just trying to interpret, maybe that's how the word Martin yeah. has to do kind with of makes sense. Strategy via this maximum. Yeah. And then, and, but then it's actually quite a far stretch to the modern use of the word martingale, right? Yeah. I don't, it seems to have lost its original meaning. Completely. I mean, now it's kind of used to mean a, a process that's balanced like, or if you think of it as a game, yeah, it's I mean, a game that can't be unfairly yeah. won by either side. You see, I don't see the balance in the origin. Well, there is some sort of balance, maybe, but I don't see in the original the strategy. And maybe it's a strategy for games that are balanced. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, no, the that's Martin right. Girl historically no, I mean, is a strategy a for a game that these ga these days would be called a Martin Girl. No, no, that's that's. Obviously, if you try to analyze this particular game with a doubling strategy, which I assume is a coin flip game or maybe some yep. other balanced game, then yes, I can see clearly that how it moves to the martingale, right? But, the, but this, it's interesting. It seems, I mean, not so many people riding horses these days anymore. I think a hundred years ago, is quite a few. would have understood the word much better about it. Yeah. For me, I have never looked it up, I just now. I mean, I'm in the process of learning. Like, I'm in a driving school at the moment because I'm trying to get a driver's license and I have to okay. learn all these rules about like what to do when horses want to turn. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, did you, did you should ask your, uh, your teacher, driver teacher, what if yeah. the horse wears a martingale? <laughs> Does that make any difference yeah. in terms of the betting way how to drive? <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah. For not being That's a good side note, yeah. Yeah. It's a mysterious word, martingale. It sounds like it's named after somebody, but it's not. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's still the origin is still into it. Must be some sort of Latin word, maybe. Yeah. It's common to all the three languages. Who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. I, I should. I'll, I'll go. I thought for next time, my homework is to look up in the Latin dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whoever's got a Latin yeah, dictionary. I guess you can go on online. Yeah. Uh, online is just fine. That's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool.